Welcome to Shop Talk Live, episode number 257, the first episode of 2022. Let's see what this year has in store for the podcast. We're starting off, Anissa, Barry, me, being silly, yapping, having fun. Before we get started, I want to let everyone know that we finally have published our first video from the shop build out. It's a introductory tour of sorts going over the basics, what machines are in there, where they are. And honestly, it is a blank slate from here on out. So be on the lookout for more shop build out videos. It's pretty exciting as we start to make this shop, which is an empty room with some incredible machines in it. Our shop, the fine woodworking shop, the shop that feels like we work out of it. So it's, it's pretty exciting. I want to give a shout out to our shop launch partners, Grizzly Industrial. Thank you so much for being involved in fine woodworking and in our shop. So enough of that, uh, head on over to the website and watch that shop tour video. I'll have it in the show notes as well. And uh, here is episode number 257. So uh, here's the dreaded beginning of the year. Do we do uh, shop resolutions? No? Yes? No. Yes. He's giving me the, the look of pain. He just birthed the something. I don't know what it was. I did <laughs> I did recently get something that I think will help my year. What's that? And a table saw. No, you didn't, finally. Well yeah, yeah, yeah but it's a, go. Yeah. But what? Uh, what what, what, but, what are you what well, hands you gonna What are you and I gonna talk here? about now? Here goes the dog. I know. <laughs> Get him. Bongo! Um, yeah, so it's a little tiny thing. It the And the fence is trash. Absolute trash. I can take my finger and deflect it in the back. Um, no, that's not good. No, so I'm not going to use it for ripping. Um, the bandsaw that I was borrowing, we put back in the fine woodworking shop. Um, so I had room for a table saw. And I'm probably just going to slap a little crosscut sled on it and just dedicate it to joinery. Yeah, so you are, you've been seeking out a t- small table saw just for cross cutting, right? Yes. Yeah. And I was hoping to get panels done, and this may be overly hopeful. Like, you have panels on this saw instead of just tenons and styles and rails. Um, but yeah, just cutting things to equal length is huge because then you can reference and, you know, square because then you can reference off the end for joinery which like is in every article that we do. Like whenever I think about how to cut joiner, it's like, well, if I reference off the end, no. <laughs> like, yeah, you don't get to do that. So, so this should be cool for that. It, I'll do it, all the milling at the shop. Is it that little craftsman that you were looking yeah. at from yeah. like the little, 60s or something? An old two inch blade. It's like a little rotary tool blade. <laughs> <It's a tiny laughs> what size blade is it really? I think it's eight. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm happy. So for my year, that, that table saw is like colored my year, you know? Yeah. That changes your whole workflow now. Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to, so, so you found if you have a very, very small, like single bedroom shop, right? Mm -hmm. And you had an old Delta band saw in there for a little while. Yeah. Which is wonderful to have. but, But you didn't use it or it just wasn't worth the space. It, I was, it was on loan from the magazine. So when we got the new shop, <laughs> nobody, they, nobody cared. <laughs> you brought it back voluntarily. I did. I did. It, it Harry felt, is a good boy scout. Were you a boy scout? No, no. I wish then I could tie knots. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was so for me, it was I'm just loan. picturing Barry with two pieces of rope, just going, uh, <laughs> dude. <laughs> every time I have to use ratchet straps, I have to relearn how to use ratchet straps. I want like, I want this embedded in, and I know the ratchet straps aren't knots, but it's getting to the same point. Shut up. Um, <laughs> no, the Rat- ratchet are straps Especially- are frustrating. They can be like, there's a learning curve to them. It's it's I- like a learning step yeah. every time. Like a, like a, like it's straight up and then over and then I forget about it. Yeah. It's like it once you learn it, it's, it's, set. it's a stair master. 
Mm. It's the same step over and over and over. All right. So that's a tour. <laughs> so no, but the bandsaw was marvelous. And this, so I really struggled like bandsaw a table saw for a tiny shop because the bandsaw, you could break down lumber, you could resaw, which is huge. You know, um, if you tune it up nice, you can do tenons. But the, I was always like, you know, the grass is always greener. <laughs> so the idea of cutting things square into equal length with a stop block always just kind of teased me um because then you can do less handwork mm -hmm. with, with not that i'm a, like putting down handwork but hopefully like you can get joints nice off the saw instead of futzing with them for a long time and then futzing with them too far and having to repair them and then futz some more yeah it um, just wasn't the handwork you wanted to do right yeah so so I got a little table saw when the uh, bandsaw went back, which I think That's eased the cool. pain of having to bring back the bandsaw. But I also haven't assembled the bandsaw at the shop. So it feels like it feels like breaking <laughs> up with someone and then oh boy. giving their stuff back <laughs> or like posting nasty stuff about them online. It's like I'm being really petty. <laughs> you know, like I'll, I'll bring it back, but I'm not, I'm not putting the table on. You know? No, that's my fault. That's my fault. You that. Yeah. I, Cause I keep saying I'm going to do it as a video and I haven't done it, but my, uh, I have decided that this year I need to, uh, there's a couple of organizational things I have to do in my shop and just like little sections where, uh, so I had a little workbench as a kid, right. And my dad still had it and he brought it up here for my kid. And so we made like this whole little section over there with my old workbench for, for my son. And he, he goes, Oh, it's my workbench. And then he comes out to work on something and sits at the other workbench and works on <laughs> it. And it's just, there's this little, you know, two by three workbench taking up space that doesn't get used and just gets stuff stored on it. And I just, I can't be sentimental about it anymore. I don't know if I'm going to throw it out, but it's just not conducive to the organization level that I like to, keep things up. And so I need to reprioritize a couple of sections of my shop. And, uh, that's, that's the thing that I really hope to do in the next, and also my whole work from home area here. I need to like actually commit to it and say, yeah, this is not, this is, this is where I'm going to be working out of most of the time and might as well put some time and money into it and make it nicer. So. Yeah. And yeah. that's what, that's what the floor and the walls in this room are about uh, it's taken almost two years and i'm just like just just reconcile yourself to this is going to be your main workspace and yeah. get it get it up to par but. yeah i you know like i just i just threw things on top of one another to get through yeah. you know yeah like i've got a piece of wood on top of some cinder blocks and that's what my monitor and my speakers are sitting on it's just like this is this is not cool yeah, and then same. I've got a piece of plywood clamped to it, and that's what this computer's on. Yeah, <laughs> you know, just hanging serious. Off the front. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's just not good, you know. So um, one of these days. Oh, and the big th I I need to. There's a few like huge air gaps in my envelope of this building uh, that I I feel like if I fix those, it would be a lot easier to keep it comfortable out here. So I need to one day just kind of tear tear things apart, get things away from the perimeter here and, um, seal those things up and then just build a series of boxes for the work from home stuff. That's bigger than just, you know, throwing yeah. out an old bench. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Escalated fast. Yeah. I think the air ceiling would take half a day, but we'll see. All right. Uh, all right. Should we answer some questions or try? Yeah. Try. All right, yeah, I like I, I'm I'm excited about this one. Given Barry's newfound table saw, them. Yeah, it almost sounded as though we were answering that first question. I know. Um, well, oh, I have opinions about Barry's resolution. <laughs> <laughs> I, I threw this in here because I thought, oh, Barry's like knee deep in this, but yeah, he's he's past it now. But from John, recently found the podcast. I've been working my way through the back catalog. Uh, a lot of it goes over my head as I'm still very much a beginner, but I feel like I'm learning a lot from all of you. That's good. Thank you, John. Um, 
I've sought out many episodes discussing what table saw is right for a beginner and if a job site saw is worth it or not. The same for a contractor saw with a terrible fence that requires hitting a ha- hitting it with a hammer. Um, my current predicament is he in 2020 he bought a DeWalt job site saw. Uh, I haven't used it much because it's so bad and so inaccurate that I can never get square or straight cuts. I finally built an uh, outfeed table and modified the fence to be longer. Um, that was a little bit better, but not much. About a month ago, I bought an old D- Delta contractor saw. It seemed to be great, but the fence definitely requires a mallet and a lot more patience than I have. I almost bought a Vega fence, which I don't know what that is, but I couldn't bring myself to spend more on the fence than the saw. Um, I bought Craig Precision bandsaw fence and used a four-inch piece of extruded aluminum, four-foot piece of extruded aluminum. It works pretty well, but there's some deflection. So it's he's he's dressing up a saw basically. Um, he, long story short, am I better off dealing with what I have or buying a hybrid saw like a Grizzly or Laguna F1? Ultimately, I want a saw stop, but I feel like I should get either the contractor or professional in a 36 inch fence. Can't decide if it's worth waiting until I can afford a good saw with a really good fence as my frustrations have been with accuracy or just settling and getting a hybrid saw. Um, I would say this, a hybrid saw is not going to have a lesser fence. Probably either the, yeah. like any of those a grizzly or jet Laguna, whatever fences are pretty dang good on them. Uh, my first real table saw was, a uh, uh, the grizzly 0715 P and, uh, I don't know why I remember that number, but, um, the saw was better than my, well, I like the saw more than my Unisaw. Well, I don't. It was easier to what? finesse than the Unifence. Really? Yes. It was easier to. You mean like tap like it tap, over, or... tap it over half a sixty fourth? Get out. Yeah, yeah. This one is kind of I don't know. I love I love the Unifence, but there's there's I love aspects of it, but there's aspects I don't love. All right, so Barry. I was in the same place where, so like, why have a table saw if the fence isn't good? You know, that, yeah. Um, unless you're going to, it's tiny and you put a little crosscut sled on it and you dedicate a joinery. Like, <laughs> and so. Wait, so did you I, decide to do that after you bought the saw or did you decide to do that? Now, I knew that was prior. probably always going to be the case because a, a little saws are not wonderful with the fences. You know, I was hoping I could at least put it in place and use a miter gauge. And like cut tenons that way or something, but I figured uh, I put. It, I figured I figured it'd be a cross cutting machine. No, the the way you are planning on using your table saw, I think, is very particular to your situation. Yes. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I can't think of like like when you describe how you're going to use it, I'm like that totally makes sense for Barry, but not many anyone. Other people. Right. So yeah. if. If I wasn't in my particular situation, I can't imagine buying a table saw with a bad fence. And you're right. Those hybrid saws do not have, like, they, they don't have fences that are going to deflect. I think those are straight up normal Biesemeyer fences style. that you're going to get on. Yeah, Biesemeyer, no, it's Biesemeyer style. Um, so I think the only difference between it and the saw stop, or like one of the hybrids and the saw stop, aside from size, is power, maybe dust collection. And well, then the flesh sensing technology oh, of sorry, a sauce. Sorry, yeah. yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that little thing too. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, he mentioned saw stop job site saw, so it was. Yeah. So I guess he wants a flesh. Anyway, the fence for me is a priority over power, probably. Agreed. Um, and none of the hybrids. The hybrids are going to do you just fine, in my experience. Yeah. Um, so I had a, like a, it was maybe, I think it was like a hundred, $150 new table saw when I first started out and it was bad. I mean, it was really, really, really bad. Was Um, it a handsaw? No, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was a bottom of the line craftsman. Um, and a, a bottom of the line new craftsman. Um, which 
I, they don't even really make a saw like this cra- from what I've seen anymore. Um, but the miter gauge was absolutely unusable and you couldn't get a new miter gauge for it because the slot was like proprietary to the junkie miter gauge. And, um, I went through the thing where, uh, there was a, there was a company I think called like Rousseau or something that sold tables for job site saws that the job site saw would sit in. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. And then it would have a nice like T square f- style fence that referenced off that table. Mm-hmm. Right. So I had like this $150 table saw and then I probably spent $150 on this table that I thought was going to get me through until blah, blah, blah. And then the, then the, but then the miter gauge was still an issue, you know? So it was, I was just throwing good money after bad. That's exactly what I thought when I was reading his description of like, yeah. oh, and then I bought this fence and then that fence and I put on these rails and it kind of works like just, just cut your losses. Yeah. And Lisa, well, what do you think? Uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking too about what he was doing and about what I'm doing with my Subaru, but that's a <laughs> different story. Um, I think I, it's, it's hard. These kinds of questions are hard because you don't, we don't actually know what somebody's financial situation oh, yeah. is. You know, we don't know what their shop yeah. looks like. It's, it's, um, it's frustrating to want to give somebody a good answer without, you know, having all, all the information, but it does seem as though he keeps making little incremental fixes to get himself closer to where he actually wants to be. Um, and, you know, maybe he can resell those two other saws. Yeah. Um, as far as the, the hybrid versus the, and, and the contractor saw and the cabinet saw, um, my first real table saw was the DeWalt hybrid. I think John T Had bought it. that off yeah. of me. I think he, yeah. but he doesn't have it anymore, right? He has right. the, oh, he yeah, the yeah. Um, so, I mean, that was, that was a, that was a really great saw. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um, so that was a, that was a great saw that got me through a, many years and then I upgraded to the saw stop cabinet saw um and then I before we got on here I was looking at the price difference between the the contractor saw and the cabinet maker saw and at that point I don't know especially if you're going to upgrade the contractor saw with the cast iron wings I think he was talking about that yeah, he has that later on. Yeah. I didn't I didn't price that out, but there isn't as significant a price difference as I thought there would be between the contractor saw and the cabinet saw for saw. So, stop. but okay, so when you're saying the contractor saw, the saw so saw stop sells an actual site. Well, they they sell like a, a like a folding based job site saw. Yeah. And then they sell a contractor saw with a motor hanging off the back. And then they've got oh, the, the and then they have then the next one's the one that we have at the new shop the um, the three horse cabinet yeah, but like the job site saw. This is a tough one. Okay, so first off, John, I think like any newer hybrid saw, like Barry, your brother's got a rigid that you really like, right? Except the fence for a very <laughs> oh, particular. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Except for a very particular reason, it, it's not the. I don't know what it's. So there's the fence, and then like the platform it sits on. I don't mm-hmm. know what that's called, but that platform is higher than the saw table, and so as you're pushing like lo- long board over, like you're ripping something a few feet long, it's riding on the platform of the fence and mm-hmm. then the table and then as you leave the platform it goes donk and it keeps on going that bothers me because i want one surface and i want that surface to be the saw table mm-hmm. i haven't had any issues with it and it's i think a very i think it's particular to that saw okay um but i like it 
don't know why you're like a <laughs> Well, because you were you were kind of looking at one at, at, at one point. Um, so I think any modern ish hybrid saw with a riving knife would be in play yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, you can get them off Craigslist. You know, if you were buying like a job site saw, maybe for the price of those two job site saws, you could probably get a used hybrid saw with a riving knife, you know, yeah. that might be worth looking into. Um, I don't know if I would, if I was going to wait for a saw stop, I don't think, and I've debated this myself many times. I don't think I would wait for the job site. Because it's you'd go right to the professional, I or or I would go to the contractor saw, contractor. but that job site saw is loud and a lot less enjoyable to work at. Like, um, but this I thing you know, scream at you. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the saw saw, but the job site saws that I've used just yeah. scream. It's like, ah, shut up, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but see, like, to the other thing though is Tamar Hannah throws yeah. every everything out the window when I think of what your what a, a job site saw is capable of. Cause she's using a DeWalt, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the she, one I'm assuming he had. She's using the heck out of it. So it's like like watching her YouTube videos, I'm just constantly like, dude, you 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 can't ever blame anything on your table saw ever again. I know. Like that's I know, I know. She's just better than you. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> um, but I, I think a riving knife would be needed too. If I was going to be buying anything newer in a table saw, if I'm ripping, I have to have a riving knife. Yeah. Yeah. I like one. It makes me feel a lot better. Me too. Yeah. Well, uh, do, 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 do. let's answer the next question. Deal. All right. Um, let's see from Chris, I've officially run out of floor space in my shop. I just bought a scroll saw on Craigslist and I have nowhere to store it. I'm thinking about making a cabinet style base out of plywood for my band saw and putting a shelf in there to store the scroll saw on when not in use. My band saw is the standard Grizzly ultimate 14 inch bandsaw and has the included base modeled off the old deltas. Um, it is crazy heavy and I'm wondering if there's a construction method with a relatively small footprint that I could, that could support the weight. Would vibration be worse on a plywood box than, a, than the current metal stand? I'd like the whole thing to be mobile, but I'm fine, but buying nice casters and, and I'm, f and I'd be fine buying nice casters or a different mobile base to make it work. <sighs> I've thought about this. The vibration thing? I know I've thought about a because yeah, I look over there and that is a big old waste of space under my bandsaw. Oh uh, yeah. But I just don't think that's the place for me to find it. What do you think, Anisa? Um I agree with you, Ben. I think the makeshift base for the bandsaw to store the scroll saw in is probably not, not, I don't, I can't imagine it being the best idea. Not only are you going to get the vibration in the bandsaw itself, but then it's going to be vibrating the scroll saw inside there. Am I, am I misinterpreting what he's saying he's going to do? Or well, I don't it, think he's using the scroll. Do you think he's going to use a scroll saw down there? No, he's or not going like, to use especially it. Especially not at the same time as the bandsaw. Right. No, but That's I still efficiency. think like... <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't want to store any of my tools in something that's going to be vibrating all the time. You know what? I uh, didn't think of that, but I, yeah. Uh, Cause that's, that's yeah. yeah. That's how stuff like magically stops working. Or <laughs> magically unthreads and a part yeah. falls off or yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but that said, I'm a big fan of mobile bases and I've seen so many people who have shops that are tiny um, and I do this too. I, everything that I can have mobile is mobile and I push stuff around to get out of my way when I need to. Um, but call me paranoid. I just think having, I think that base maybe will absorb some extra vibration with the wood instead of the metal. I don't know, but I, I just wouldn't want my other tool 
inside there dancing around while I was using the bandsaw. That's a fascinating point. Cause I've seen those like flippy do planer carts that were yeah. really popular on YouTube a few years ago. Yeah. Like, Oh, well, that's great. Space saving solution. But if anything's vibrating, it's a planer, you know? I see. I wouldn't think the vibration would be as bad as a bandsaw. Right. Because right, bandsaw's right. got so much, um, what's that called? Centrifugal inertia or whatever, you know, like the, yeah, yeah. the, the, there's such a there's wide, big wheels, yeah. yeah. Huh. And I, I think I, the, the other thing that I'm thinking about is if you look at a bandsaw base that does have storage, cause if you, if you pay extra or whatever for many bandsaw manufacturers, there's like a little door, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not a wide open place. It's a place to store blades. It's a space place to store yeah, router true. bits or something. You're not getting a scroll saw in there. And it's like, these are the metal, heavy sheet metal wrapped things. And I think that they don't make that, that opening very big for a reason, because it it's, you need that much mass to hold things tight. I'm sure there's somebody out there with a, with a Delta style bandsaw on a wooden box. I, th the thing that I was thinking is like, I would do, if I were going to do it, I would do um, like integral joinery, mortise and tenon, and then apply plywood panels to that. Okay. So that you've, you've got the strength of, you know, mortise and tenon integral joinery, and then the racking strength of panels attached to that and that's the only way that i think it would work that makes sense i don't i i didn't think about this nearly as deeply as you guys i'm like yeah go rock it <laughs> maybe angle the sides <laughs> but the vibration thing you're absolutely right oh. and wait so why you said under the bandsaw probably isn't for you even though you would like more space ben is that because of all these problems yeah i so I've got the 055 and it's got the open base or whatever. And mm -hmm. currently under there is a pile of dust, a couple of broken somethings. Um, and, so, and my bandsaw blades just get thrown under there and old bandsaw blades get thrown under there for some weird reason. But yeah, that would be a great place to put something like my scroll saw, which is over there. Um, yeah. But um, it's not that big of a space too yeah that's true you'd have to build a really big base yeah like i feel like you'd be putting the bandsaw on a large base rather than it being a base for a bandsaw you know what i mean like like i i'm looking at and it's you know maybe 14 by 18 yeah that's true and yeah if you had it open on one side you could slide a scroll saw in there or you could you know store something in there but i just i I think there's better places to find in most shops, yeah. but I don't know. I, I am a big fan of like, I would like to build a flip top cart like you were talking about. Yeah. They seem really nifty. I feel like I could get, get a kick out of it every time I used it too. Yeah. Would you wheel a fortune? It? That's what I want to know. What? Wheel of fortune. <laughs> Not Wheel of Fortune. Uh, uh, what price are you right. talking about? Prices. Price so you right. would just like let it loose and see what tool? Yeah, just like yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know the Price is Right where people go up to that wheel at the yeah. end for the showcase showdown, and like yeah. some of them just rip it, and other people like strategic. Like I'm gonna get eighty five cents and like do a very. I think I would do that if I had a flip cart. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> I feel very judged by Anissa. Rightfully so. <laughs> Spot on. <laughs> what 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 tools of yours are on carts, Anissa? Uh, my bandsaws on a cart. Um, my planer and my jointer both have those like foot pedal things that you could hoist them up and scoot them around. Um, my chop saw is on a mobile cart. Um, and I have lots of stuff. Well, that's not really the vibration thing that we're talking about. It's on, on kind of a huge mobile station. Um, and I have lots of stuff stored under that. 
Um, that's it. <laughs> but I do have a scroll saw down my basement. And when I do bring it up to my shop, if that day ever comes, I'll have to think long and hard about where I'm going to put it. Maybe on its own. I don't. Yeah, this is a good question. I definitely would not be putting it under my bandsaw, but maybe under a sharpening station that I, I'm going to build a sharpening station at some point fairly soon. And that would be a good spot for it under there. Um, hmm, good question. Maybe I will put it under my bandsaw. Because <laughs> where else am I going to put it? My shop is tiny too. No, it's not. It's not. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, all two stories of it. Whoa. <laughs> Tiny this shot. footprint. I keep my lumber on an entertainment center that my landlord's left behind. I store my scroll saw under my bandsaw. That's how tiny my shop is. <laughs> you have neither of those things. <laughs> Wait a second. The only so – I've gone out of my way to try and keep from w having to wheel things around, but I, there's just no way yeah. to totally do it. I've got the drum sander that I feel like needs to get a cart made for it because that's got, like, that bandsaw thing, you know, the sheet metal legs that splay out, oh, and it yeah. takes up way more room than the actual unit. Um, but soon I think I'm going to put my planer on the – bottom shelf of that cart and that would i think that would make me feel better about that waste of space um but the 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 only other thing that i have that i wheel around a lot i have like you know one of those um you know those roll around carts like those rubber made commercial mm -hmm. industrial carts and then we have like you know 20 million of at the at the fine woodworking shop and I always think it's great to have, but I spend most of my time pushing it from one side of the shop to the other side of the shop. And I don't know if it's going to, if it's long for this place, but that's it. I think that's the only thing that's mobile. Get out. Yeah. Everything else is pretty stationary here. <laughs> I struggle with things on wheels. Like it makes perfect sense. And I imagine I would do it too, if I had like a lot of machines in a tight space but I feel like things are either in a corner or in the way when they're on wheels. Yeah. And, or maybe yeah. in use. Yeah. Which I know is the whole point. Like, that's why they're on wheels. It still gets me. <laughs> well, I keep, I keep thinking that, you know, so a section, a four foot section of my shop, I can't stand under. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would love to one day make that almost like a place where, the top is lumber storage and under it, everything is on a cart and just rolls under there into place. And then you pull it out and use it. Love and, it. And like everything gets stored right in its own little garage section of that. But the joiner just screws it all up. It's just, nope. That joiner really has to be up against that back wall. So like right now, if I want to get to my joiner, I got to move that stupid cart and I got to move... Um, I got to move the, the drum sander and it's just, Oy. yeah. Yeah. I got, yeah I moving stuff around is not ideal for sure. But then I always think about David Johnson, um, his shop and he does the amazing stuff that he does. And he's just like, everything is stored in a tiny little space. He pulls it out when he needs it. Really? And just, he makes yeah, but in order for him to do anything, he has to move like 12 chairs too at the boat before. Well, yeah, yeah, but I, you know, not yeah. everybody's doing the the chair reconstruction and, and rehab that he's doing. I'm not as yeah. zen as David, though. Like, is anybody maybe he really like the way he just goes about doing everything is just so like, oh, yeah, I need to just chill out. <laughs> And he has a multi-router. Uh, I love that. I he love does, that. Yeah. He's got yeah. like that tiny shop and then there's right. a multi-router. It's like, Whoa, okay. It's like, yeah, I've got a bandsaw that. and a multi-router and I can yeah. make beautiful things. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, all right, let's take a break. All right. I'm gonna go potty. 
At Peters Valley School of Craft, their in-person workshops are back. Workshop registration is now open, and they're looking forward to seeing you in 2022. Come focus, explore, and create at their immersive craft school in the Delaware Water Gap. One class that looks super interesting to me is Make and Weave a Shaker Stool, taught by Ellie Richards. Ellie in the Woods on Instagram, basically my new favorite Instagram account. Head on over to petersvalley.org to learn more or call 973-948-5200. Sticking with the theme of doing more with less. <laughs> um, my all-time, and I, I realized I've been doing segments without introducing what the segment is. And I know they're not that complicated, but like I hope, I, I apologize. Listen. Um, as someone who loves narrative, I feel like I should be doing a better job. <laughs> So and Ben, you got a lot of complaints about Barry not introducing his segment, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What well, were no, they, they just talking? say they just say Barry, but I assume <laughs> <laughs> I assume it's a complaint. <laughs> just said his name in it. <laughs> um, so doing more with less. My all-time favorite technique, I guess, is uh, a curved call, a bowed call. Um, oh. So doing panel glue ups, you have a clamping call that is kind of U-shaped and it's crook. So it's bent along its length. Anyway, it's U-shaped. So as you do a panel glue up and they're out of alignment, you have these bowed calls. And as you clamp, it brings a U into a flat and it pushes the misaligned panels into place. This was great. So I use this a bunch, but when it really came into, it come into play twice at my brother's. The first time we were building, it was last year, we were building a farmhouse table. Big, a lot of boards getting glued up and he didn't have a joiner. He had a planer. We were buying lumber from the home center. Like nothing was perfect, you know? Um, So to get the panels into alignment, I used curved calls and they came, I mean, they weren't perfect. Like it's not, this was not a Garrett hack farmhouse table, but it made things really manageable and nothing was hideous. There were no enormous gaps or little ledges. Um, it made the whole process doable instead of like me standing on the boards and telling my brother to tighten the clamps, you know, because that was <laughs> option B. Um, and it, le- I think it even let us do the breadboard ends successfully and then i did it again when i was down there a couple of weeks ago my mom wanted maple floating shells and yeah. and <laughs> that project can go away <laughs> yeah, I'm so tired of by the end. um but again curve calls it let me bring boards into planarity make them coplanar make them flush it yeah. was and it's like the silliest, stupid, not stupid, simplest idea. And it works like a charm. And I didn't have to make the calls, which was huge. I just grabbed a two by four <laughs> that my brother had lying around. And so it wasn't anything fancy, you know, and, it wasn't and anything. You, you planed the curve into it or something, or was it just a two by four that was a warp? No, it was just a, it was just a two by four with a bow. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just look for the closest crooked piece. And it was nice. so two by four is nice because it get had that You're the only width. one who walks into Home Depot and was like, Yeah, that's the one. where the call's at. <laughs> I was talking to someone, apparently a woodworking store used to sell bowed calls. Yeah. For like a pre- I'm sure no, I'm sure they still do, I think. Yeah. And like cool. I mean, they work. So like if you got the money, buy them. Well, but there was also like a, a slot routed on the other end that your clamp would sit in, you know, I, uh, okay. I think there was more than just a, a, a cambered piece of wood there. That, because that was one of the frustrating things trying to like get this, I'm going to say crappy, but standard two by four to like stand on its edge while I was tightening clamps. It wasn't, wasn't ideal, yeah. but yeah, I just, and I did mark that two by four, like call, do not throw out, you know? Um, but again, it, like nothing took fancy machinery. It was just, Find a crooked two by four, bring panels into flat, call it good. Nice. Yeah. I like it. Anissa, do you have anything? I do. I'm really, I've always been partial to spacers. Um, 
there are so many different uses in the shop. Um, and, and this is actually going to tie into one of those, one of the next comments or questions that you have coming up. Um, but so we've all, I've seen people using spacers in the shop and I use them all the time. Um, whether you're using it to, I, the most fantastic use of them, I think is so you don't have to reset anything. Yeah. Like that's the best place to use a spacer so that, you know, like if you're using um, a biscuit joiner or a, a mm. anything, if you're cutting, if you're cutting, cross cutting something and you want to quickly pull out different sizes and you don't want to have to remeasure all the time, just pop a spacer in there and cut with the spacer in, take the spacer out, that kind of thing. Um and I always use them whenever I can. And it's so interesting because that floor that I was talking with you guys about that I'm painting, um, it's very geometric. And it was, as woodworkers, like a lot of what we do, a lot of what we know just innately with all this stuff that starts to come so naturally to us in the shop, it transfers out into the world in, in, in so many different ways. I mean, woodworking is not the only thing that that does that but so I'm painting this floor and I have all these repeating patterns on the floor and um it occurred to me when I was marking everything out and taping the lines off to just pull out the spacers and so I quickly ran to the shop and cut I needed an L bracket for one of them to to space on a corner so I just cut 45 like I cut L pieces on the table saw and plop my square in there. But uh, so this is my my pitch for spacers being my all time favorite. I don't know if you would call that a tool or a technique or a combo. Yeah. So tool. Yeah. Tool. Is it a tool? Yeah. Yeah. Technique. Yeah. No, I don't know. So let, yeah, so I I see how this is coming up in a in a question. Yeah. yeah. And. I'm totally with you though. It's like my first thought for anything is like, can I make a spacer to help yeah. do this? Yeah. And that's a very woodworker thing. Yeah. Yep. With the table saw, I'm going to cut some double tendons coming up. I'm like, oh, I can do like a flip yeah. and a spacer move. Oh, I'm going to be a real yeah. <laughs> Wait, didn't Tamar, um, Tamar did something with spacers with you, Barry, right? Oh, the chance. router table spacers. Yeah. 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 Yep. That's a good one. Yeah. Note. Well, and then you did that video. Um, That's what I thought. You oh, did the video Libby of the Shrum. domino, the Libby Shrum's mm -hmm. technique of, of do yeah. and that. I still have those spacers sitting in my domino case because like oh, yeah. half the stuff in the domino case is going to get thrown out one day, but those spacers are going to stick around. And actually, I think I've talked about spacers. I remember talking about spacers before and, and thinking, oh, wait, Libby had a whole bunch of different ways she used spacers. And I keep meaning to circle back and say, weren't we going to do an article on spacers? Mm. Because the it's spacers are great. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's been a while. Um, my all-time favorite tool of all time for this week is... Uh, I've been uh, out of woodworking for a couple of weeks. I s screwed up my shoulder and I just have to be taking it easy. And, um, but uh, yesterday, a day or two ago, I, I walk in the house and, and Katie goes, I'm, I'm going to come out there in, in a minute and make something. I was like, right on, you know? And she needed some weaving thing. It was, you know, a stick with nails in it, blah, blah, who knows what, right? And, um, but she just came out and said, I need a piece of wood this big. And, and she looked over there and she goes, all right. And we, we cut the, the piece to the dimension she needed. And then, uh, she went to the drill press and we, and she drilled a bunch of holes and whatever. And then she, the, uh, the corners needed to be eased. And she goes, uh, which one of these sanders should I take to? I was like, oh, just I handed her the little Veritas apron plane or, or is it the apron plane or the violin makers plane, whatever, the little stainless steel one that I have, the fancy one. And I was like, just, and she, I, we put it in the vice and she took like two swipes and she goes, this is really? fun. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just so nice to see the satisfaction. And that little plane is, 
you know, it's small. You can fits in your hand perfectly. And, uh, I've got, uh, I think I've got that blade sharpened at 40 degrees or something. So, you know, the chance of it tearing out on a corner, or I think it's 45, actually the chances of it tearing out on a corner slim to none. And I mean, that thing just for easing edges and all that stuff. I think I've done this. I must've done this plane before, but it deserves another round of applause because it's now like Katie's all time favorite tool. Of all time, <laughs> think, you know, so just a, we should have had a cameo. Yeah. Just a perfect tool though. Like they absolutely, well, there was one thing, the adjuster is loose from the, from the factory. Everybody agrees. It, it loosens up. Right. Um, and I just put a little bit of uh, Loctite on there and then uh, it's fine now. So that BVD has the same thing in his tool cabinet. The thing behind his bench, he has two block planes, block planes. And one of them is sharp, low angle block planes. One of them sharpened to 45. He's yep. like, this is my plane for breaking edges. Yep. You know, it's just, it's brilliant. Well, and I didn't set out to sharpen it at 45. It's a really small blade and they, mm -hmm. mm, okay, fine. It wasn't a perfect tool. Hang on. It's a really small blade and the blade, if they had used straight sides the whole way, that's why I sent fine. mine back. That's it why I sent mine back. Would be totally fine, but they didn't. So the only way that it'll fit in my little Lee Nielsen honing guide <laughs> is if I sharpen it at 45 degrees and so as soon as I discovered that, I was like, fine, that's what this is going to be because I'm not going to uh, get the little honing guide. I'm not going to do mm. this little teeny tiny blade freehand. I'm not going to, you know, it was, uh, this fits in there at 45 and that's what I'm going with. I felt better. And then I felt worse because I felt so, so I felt better because when I sent that plane back, I'm like, you're lame. You're sending this back because the blade doesn't fit into your honing guide and you're a baby. <laughs> but then I found out you did it too, and I felt great. But then you said it fits in at 45, which is more or less what I wanted that plane for. <laughs> <laughs> this is the worst roller coaster I've ever been on. I'm sorry, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, let's answer a question. Um, so since Anissa brought this up, I wasn't going to read this part, but. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, whatever, that's fine. That's fine. It's Anissa's Anissa. podcast now. Yeah. Well, keep sending us stuff that you're not going to use or edit. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that look, Barry. I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, we're sharing a screen. I know you saw that look. <laughs> the, the listeners, however, did not. <laughs> well, you're yelling at me. Well, you're not yelling. You're criticizing me for talking about something that you gave me to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> all right this one is from jake thanks for bringing this up jake <laughs> um i know anisa has spoken on an old episode about seeing woodworking parallels and non-woodworking real world scenarios you asked to share any if we had some so i thought i'd share one uh that i just had to explain to my wife, that the rows left from the lawnmower alternate light and dark based on which way I pushed because of the chatoyance of the grass and that I have to cut the rows parallel to the street. Otherwise, it was perpendicular to the street or if it was perpendicular to the street, this is where it gets way off the rails. You'd see the end grain <laughs> <laughs> when looking from the street and no one wants to see end grain. <laughs> oh, man. You know what? He's right, though. Like, even when you're vacuuming, like, you see the Chatorians on the back, like, the little Yeah, but the, the end grain, like, like, identifying yeah, yeah. it as end grain is, is, is next level. Like, yeah, that's... Yeah, it is. Yeah, you're, you're broken, Jake. I'm sorry. <laughs> now your wife knows it, too. Yeah. I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just imagining Jake driving down the road and just looking at a yard being like, oh, and crane. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. So here's a question. I find that I spend months and months on a piece of what I'd like to think is fine furniture, but then throw some crappy stick on foot pads on the bottom so the piece doesn't scratch the floor. Best case scenario, I get the plastic ones with the spike in the middle to go in the end grain bottom of the leg 
of the piece? Is there a finer version that I don't know about? Maybe people make them or what? I guess what I'm asking is what do you do or the fine furniture makers of yore put on the bottom of furniture to prevent scuffing? So I just use those felt pads that you pull the double stick tape. Lame. Yeah, but I have seen two woodworkers, very accomplished woodworkers, um, using the little plastic ones with the with the point that he's talking about. Get out. One. Yep. And I've also Don't seen name an, names. I'm not naming names. And I've also Thank seen another <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I did not. I did not. And, <laughs> That was Barry, uh. and it's not true. <laughs> I'm not talking about Mike Pekovich. Um, and then the other one uses those felt pads with the double stick stuff. However, he, I watched him do this. He cuts them to the shape of whatever he's using them for. Mm-hmm. And then he super glues them to the bottom. Um, oh, so they're not just like flapping off in five years. Right. Hmm. And However, like those little pad things, I have them on my kitchen chairs. They, they collect a lot of stuff um, and yeah. they do eventually fall off. But those are the two things I've seen people do other than me. Um, have you guys seen anybody else using other stuff? What do you, what have you got, Ben? Jeff Lefkowitz taught me this Uh-oh. and it's, it's money. Um, he gets a, a chunk of leather. And, oh. um, so as the piece is large, he puts, I think just liquid hide glue over the whole back of it, just paints it on there, lets it dry. And then he cuts out with like a three quarter inch leather punch circles. Hmm. So then you've got your little pads. Oh, get out of here. And, and then you, at the bottom of the leg paint on liquid hide glue or hide glue, whatever, let it soak in, let it dry, paint some more hide glue on and stick the leather on there, hold it down with tape until it dries and it's on there. Barry, I believe I've, I fixed a chair of yours. I believe there's leather pads on the bottom of that chair. I think I'm sitting on it. I I need you to repair something else. Uh, Yeah, I know the crest is. (laughs) No, not yeah, The crest is my shirt, but some of the, the, not spokes. I can't think of the word right now. So anyway, but, that's brilliant. Yeah, it is. That is the finer way of doing it, if you ask me. So why are you, are you just sizing the leather with the hide glue? Yeah. And sizing the bottom of the, and then letting it dry. And then you do like an actual adhesive coat. Yes. And I am absolutely sure you could do it in one coat and you could probably do it with tight bond one or two or whatever, or you could do it with whatever. That's the way Jeff taught me to do it. And David Duyard taught me to do it. And that's the way I do it. Got it. And hide glue sticks to itself, right? Whereas like, yeah. I feel yeah. like if you coat the back of leather with tight bond, you kind of smoke the leather. Like it'll never stick to anything again. Oh, I love the, go on. Sorry, you go. No, I love, I love the idea of, painting something with hide glue, like, and saving it for later. It, doesn't someone, like, freeze hide glue in a little... Uh, well, David and, the, and Jeff, cube tray. yeah, that, yeah, they, they do that as well, uh, liquid hide glue. It's just... And it's, ice cube trays, is, and then, so then you get, like, little bricks, and you just throw them yeah. in your little glue pot. And, huh. you know. I cool love idea. that. And it's reversible, too, so if you want to replace yeah. those pads, you just heat heat it up and... Yeah. Or, you know, they're going to wear out eventually then, you know, and like those plastic ones with the nail, no, not in my house. Mm -mm. Because if you have ever seen them break apart and then you've just got a brad nail sticking out of the bottom. And, um, (laughs) in my old house in Nashville, there's a spot where like we had a chair from Goodwill or something and that happened. And, we would just be sitting on it and there's a spot that is just like dimpled, dimpled, you know, like three dozen dimples in this area from that brad nail just pushing into that the maple floor even, you know? So Dude. No, I I won't allow them in my house. I'm doing the leather thing. So I have I those like little it. plastic things on my dining table and I hate them. 
And I tried to, and I, I screwed it up twice because when I built it, I knew I was going to hate the plastic pads. I'm like, I'll just put one on each. It's like a trestle table, one on each foot in the middle. No, it just makes it tippy. So now there's like one in the middle and like one off center to kind of counter. I hate them. I can see them from my living room. So I yeah. think I'm going to have to do the leather thing. The, o- the only difficulty was finding that a large enough leather punch because they're not mm-hmm. cheap. Um, I got one off that auction site. You and I surf every night. Oh, yeah. Um, or I didn't get one. I bought, got a bunch and had to s- eBay the rest of them. But um, what auction site are you talking I'll about? I'll tell you offline. I don't need ah, <laughs> yeah, What is right. this? <laughs> Trying to blow off spots. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, so getting a, a leather punch that large is difficult. I took a piece of EMT conduit and ground a bevel into it oh i remember this yeah, yeah yeah. and tried to use that and i it was usable for a couple of punches it didn't last though you maybe if you use black pipe sure. you could um but yeah i i got the leather punch and uh that was worth it. it's worth it for that alone because and then right. you, you do a bunch you, you know you do a big piece of leather and then you just punch them out as you need them or whatever. But I've got, you know, probably a dozen of these little discs just waiting, ready to go with hide glue on the back already. So, right on. Yeah. But <clears throat> All right. Anything else? That's all I got. All right. Me too. Me too. Um, okay. We probably shouldn't have saved this one to last. But from Bob, I have a planning question. I'm planning on building a better workbench than I now have. I want to laminate the top. Most instructions use, most instructions direct the use of a jointer and planer, which I don't have. They usually say to glue it up in sections, flatten the sections, then glue the sections together. Since I'll be hand planing the top, is there a benefit to doing it in sections rather than gluing it up and planing the whole top at once? Dima, we ask that. Yeah. I have two answers. And <laughs> one is to his question, and one is to the, what preceded his question. So, no, I would not. I don't see a benefit to planing it in sections. I would do it all at once. Since you're doing it by hand, you have that one surface. And because that, like, that one finished surface is the one that you're ultimately going to worry about, I would just handle that all together. Or at the same time, and I think the whole like sections thing is because you have machinery. And so you're limited by like the width of your planer or oh, right. It's yeah. like, cause you're not going to send a 24 inch top through a 12 inch planer. Um, not successfully. Not to, yeah, no, no, <laughs> not without a trip to the ER. <laughs> um, but so I think that's why I don't think there's any other reason other than ease of milling. And at some point, these things get terribly heavy, you know? Yeah. Um, so Wait, hang on, hang on. that's my answer is just tackle it all at once, make the top, slap it on the bench. And then what do you think, Anissa? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. For the audio only <laughs> listeners, Anissa just left during Barry's <laughs> answer. <laughs> Yeah, right. Okay, so this is going to be I'm done. Sorry. So, no. so, 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 Barry, you are doing it all at once, if by hand. I well, I'm assuming that he's cleaning up, like, and this gets to my other. The answer to the question that he didn't ask was, <laughs> "That's a ton of work. All that yeah. planing and jointing by hand. I mean, I don't think, I don't think it's worth it. Um, and." I'm not alone in this among like hand tooly people. Like I, Bob Rozieski said the same thing on some wood workbench video. Where he oh does yeah. It. His Nicholson, Nicholson bench, bench video, right? Yeah. And it's, it's a, this exact point. Like if you don't have machines to help you with all this planning and jointing, this is a ton of work. And I think you're going to end up pulling your hair out. Um, oops. Um, sorry, I was getting a call. Um, so I, I mean, I would do two, I would, so assuming you want something thick, I would do two, um, like 12 inch wide pieces, laminate those. And then another 12, like two 12 inch wide pieces and then glue those together. But I, I think you're going to go out of your mind. 
And I think you're going to get, unless you are excellent with hand tools, I don't think the results are going to be good. I think you're going to be chasing your tail a lot. Okay. So, all right, you're a hand tool guy. You're doing a bench. You're going to get 12 inch wide stock and just face and face glue them together. Yeah. No, I did it before. Okay. Did, 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 like there are two by 12s. Yeah. So an inch or 11 and, you know, a quarter inch. But yeah, or just do some like um, brace structure underneath, like the Nicholson has. Mm-hmm. It has these like short horizontal pieces going on the length of the top to brace it. Or buy it. Buy the top. A lot to be said. Um, but have you ever, I've never found a top to buy that is more than like an inch and an eighth thick or something, you know, like a normal butcher block countertop. But Bob buys them from somewhere. So, but he must have one, custom. Our outfeed table, we bought that top. And yeah. that I think is like an inch and a half, an inch and, I don't think it's an inch and three quarters. No, I think it's an inch and an eighth. Really? Yeah, I don't know. But it's maple. Yeah. You know? And so, like, so you don't have, like, springy pine. I I hate answering questions. I hate stating opinions is something people didn't ask. But this is one of the things where it's like, I think the laminated tops came about because of machines. And it's I think you're right, probably. Machine. Well, and, and it's, this, it's, it's easier to get quarters on stock out of a laminated top. Oh, fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fair. But... If you do want to laminate them, I would. I wouldn't save it all until the end, maybe, because I don't understand how you would do that as you're gluing things together. But I don't think I would aim for perfect on every one until the end. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, Bob, I'm sorry. I think I'd buy a planer. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like hand tool guy, like find a friend with a planer, but like, you uh-huh. don't need a joiner. I've done, yeah. I've done, um, I, so I did a, it's, it's a workbench basically, but it, it started off life as like a kitchen work table. And now it's, uh, my wife's bench in her studio. But, um, I did that top. It was, it was not worth it. I, w- I should have bought it, <laughs> but, um, I did that top out of maple, uh, ripped a bunch of pieces and, you know, flipped them and it's all three, it's a three quarter inch, bunch of three quarter inch glue ups. And, uh, I did it in two sections and it was a pain, but I cannot imagine doing it without a planer, like not at all. So I don't know. What do do you think, Anissa? What would you, I'm I'm with you on this. I am not the hand tool person that Barry is. Um, but I I would either get the planer, take it to take it to a shop and rent time on a planer and or a wall bell or something like that. Like I just I can't imagine doing that by hand. Yeah. Yeah. That's not the sexy answer. Buy yeah, it. that was no fun. Yeah, that was. <laughs> Sorry. A bunch of rain clouds over here. <laughs> cool bench, Bob. Don't do it. <laughs> Bob, don't do the woodworking. Woodworking's overrated. Well, that does it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. The internet bandwidth gods were not smiling upon us at the end. It felt like uh, the early days of the pandemic there for a while when uh, we just could not get the bandwidth to make a show happen without glitches. Let's hope it's a one-off for 2022. Uh, If you have any questions, please send them in to shoptalkataunt.com. Again, I've said it before, this show is driven by you, the listeners, and the conversations come from you and what you ask us. So shoptalkataunt.com to ask a question or to start a conversation. And uh, if you have a moment, please head on over to Apple iTunes and give us a review. It really helps us get up there in the rankings and gets this podcast in the ear holes of more woodworkers. If you're listening on YouTube, click that thumbs up button and have a great day. Have a great year. And thanks for listening. Did Ben freeze? Froze, right? 
Yeah, that is now, really See, now we can make fun, fun of Ben because he's Ben's frozen. Ben's a tech guy. No. Ah! Uh, am I back? Am, hello? Barry, mm-hmm. Barry, pretend. Barry, one, two, three, pretend you're frozen. Did we make the same frozen face? Ah, oh, it's so boring. <laughs> <laughs>